We're really uh, grateful tonight for all of you for coming. Um, we know there's multiple things happening um, at the same time tonight, uh, as well as other lightning talks. Um, I really wanted to give a, a space for the machine learning communities to come together, um, the Kubeflow ones, the OpenShift on ML um, working group, um, and so I'm really thrilled to see this many faces in the room um, to talk about one of something that's near and dear to my heart, or two things, OpenShift and machine learning. So um, please you know, join us, uh, come up and have a seat. And um, I'm also really um, thrilled and grateful to have Brandon Phillips on the stage with us tonight. Um, those of you who might have heard the news, um, CoreOS has joined Red Hat and um, it has been, you know, always, always a pleasure working with the CoreOS team in the past. And when I heard um, they were coming to join um, Red Hat, I was completely thrilled. And so I'm, I'm really pleased um, to have Brandon with me tonight. He's going to give us a little bit of an update on um, all things Red Hat and CoreOS and whatever else is not embargoed um, for his keynote. And so I'm going to, he's got a call, uh, he's got a dinner to go to um, shortly. So I'm going to let him get started, kick us off, and then we'll have everybody who is giving a lightning talk come up. And um, after that, we're going to try and do an, an Ask Me Anything panel, which means while they're talking and doing their lightning talks, we really want you to think about what kinds of questions you'd like to hear answered, and um, we're going to try and answer them tonight. So without any further ado, I give you the newest Red Hatter, <laughs> Brandon Phillips. Great. All right. Thank you very much for the warm introduction. Um, I'm going to play around with Windows here for a second. Uh, I, I have pretty much the easiest job in the world, which is to um, entertain a bunch of people who have fresh beers and food in front of them. So uh, this should go very, very smoothly. So CoreOS was acquired by Red Hat about three and a half months ago. And what I wanted to do was just walk through some of the things that we're working on. It's pretty easy for me to talk through some of this and give you a couple of live demos of it because a lot of it is things that were inside of the Tectonic product that um, we are going to be bringing to OpenShift over time. Um, so really, this is not uh, a lot of new, brand new announcements, but really just um, familiarizing folks that are inside of the OpenShift community with some of the things that we had been doing inside of CoreOS and inside of Tectonic. Um, so the first thing that... Uh, um, if you're not familiar with this, this is the uh, Tectonic console, which is an administrative console on top, of <clears throat> on top of Kubernetes. And one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing at CoreOS was rethinking the way that enterprise software was delivered and ensuring that when people get enterprise software, it has a lot of the capabilities of a cloud service. Now, when we think about a cloud service, <clears throat> there's essentially two pieces. Um, there's the hosting. That is a very traditional business where you stick a server in a rack and you give it an IP and you sell it to somebody. Um, and then there's what we eventually termed automated operations, which is this idea that um, it's not just the server and the IP, but also um, services on top, um, databases, load balancers, et cetera. And those services are unique because they, the operations are automated, the upgrades are automated, um, monitoring is automated. And so there's a lot that you get out of that by default. And so we wanted to make sure that when we delivered software to people, and that started with operating system and uh, eventually with Kubernetes, that you could also automate those operations because as a software company, we're not also going to sell you a server. So um, where automated operations ended and where it will uh, begin again inside of OpenShift is um, we have this one-click update inside of uh, Tectonic where the software, it gets a little recursive, where we're actually hosting all the components of Kubernetes on top of Kubernetes. And don't worry, we do it in a way that's safe. Um, this cluster is um, my personal cluster and it's been up <clears throat> it's been up for uh, probably eight or nine months. And um, it always... <laughs> It always surprises me because every time I log in, uh, I see all the tweaks and stuff that I saw mockups of months before on my live cluster, and I never did anything because the software is just constantly updating. Um, and so 
you'll notice inside this system uh, that all the components of Kubernetes, like the scheduler, um, is in here, and they're running as pods, which has a bunch of um, cloud-like properties. One is that I'm able to come in and actually edit the pod and upgrade the scheduler over time. And that's how we power these automated operations. So you can upgrade from Kubernetes 1.5, or Tectonic 1.5, to 1.6, to 1.7, to 1.7.1.1.2.3, all with a single click. And you actually get live telemetry back of how those things going. And you can do everything that you do normally, like drill down into the individual pods and see how much memory and CPU they're using and get uh, monitoring and metrics data back. Um, and so these are the sorts of things that will start to pour into OpenShift and was part of the announcement during the acquisition of this automated operations stuff. So that's some color around what we mean by automated operations. Um, the other thing is that sort of the namesake of the company was uh, CoreOS, um, an operating system, which we eventually renamed to Container Linux with some success of that rename. Uh, it's always challenging to rename a product. Um, but the automation and the automated operations don't just go down to the Kubernetes layer. They go all the way down to the foundation um, of the actual operating system. And so this is a brief demo. If you keep down here, uh, keep looking down here, it's looping. Um, but what we had done inside of uh, the operating system is that Kubernetes is actually con in control of the exact version of software that's running on each node. And um, that status and that information gets pushed back up to the Kubernetes control plane. Reboots are controlled across the cluster in case of security updates. Um, and you end up with a system where when we release a version of Tectonic, you get not just Kubernetes at a set version, you get the operating system at a set version, you get the, the um, Docker version of the set version, and this entire stack of software is controlled together, and it's all controlled through the Kubernetes API, so you can control, uh, monitor, and view what's actually happening um, in real time using uh, kubectl. So those are two big things that we um, plan to bring to OpenShift. Um, the other thing, uh, which we've open sourced a few of the uh, kind of secret sauce pieces of Tectonic, and um, they're now available on the uh, OpenShift GitHub, around monitoring. Um, we ended up uh, building in what we call the Prometheus operator, and then a bunch of technology around monitoring inside of Tectonic um, so that you get immediate insight, not just across the application, but across, as you saw in the previous demo, actually how the Kubernetes control plane is running. So you can dig in, debug issues, um, and that sort of thing over time, whether they're host level issues, pod level issues, or individual components like services of the Kubernetes control plane. All right, so uh, that's, that's kind of a preview of a few things that um, we've started to do that are OpenShift specific. And then the other thing is we announced today a thing that we call the operator framework. Um, and I'm gonna run through and give a quick overview of what that looks like and what we're trying to do here. Um, so this is actually my keynote two days from now, and so you're my practice audience. So <laughs> you didn't know you were in a beta, but welcome. Um, there's some joke in here about being acquired by Red Hat. I already blew that one. Uh, so operators we introduced two years ago. And the idea of operators, uh, we, we introduced an uh, operator for a database at CD and an operator for a monitoring system Prometheus. And the idea with operators is that they're these kube native applications that run in pods and are managed via kube APIs. And so by run in pods, I mean you deploy the operator on your cluster and it's just a normal Kubernetes deployment. And then managed with Kubernetes APIs means that you deploy a resource that's a brand new type of Kubernetes resource. It's not a deployment, it's not a pod, it's not a stateful set. It's an etcd cluster in the case of etcd. And the act of deploying this operator caused this new API to appear on your cluster. Um, very magical. By analogy, what we're trying to do with operators is something that's impossible to do on the public cloud, which is I have my application, whatever it is, it might be some cool open source project like Cassandra, or it might be something like an SAP integration that's specific to my organization. And I wanna make that available on the public cloud so people can deploy copies of that application. You can't do that on the public cloud. Amazon or Azure or whoever, they're not gonna let you just introduce a new you know, service that you can use the Amazon or Azure command line tools to work with. 
And so what you can do is you can use Kubernetes to make that service available. And this means that by making it available in Kubernetes, it runs across all the clouds, and you can use this API um, to not just deploy compute network and storage with containers, but some higher level service as well, um, your application. Now we have some feedback that this has worked really well. So Ticketmaster was a CoreOS uh, customer, and they use the Prometheus operator for monitoring, and they just let teams deploy monitoring services for their applications on top of the cluster. And uh, today they're now up to a couple hundred instances where teams are self-managing their monitoring infrastructure because it's just a manifest that says, I want to deploy a Prometheus cluster, I want it to be available at this, name, uh, at this host name, and it needs to monitor these things. And so by lowering the barrier to managing a piece of software, you get more consumption of it, which is exactly how the clouds grow so quickly. Um, and we're hoping that by taking advantage of that success of cloud, um, but bringing it to Kubernetes, we can um, grow the overall base of Kubernetes software. So our goals here are to bring more operators um, into the ecosystem uh, and make them in use by more people. So the operator framework is this toolkit where we're making it easier for people to build these kube native apps like we've done with etcd, like we've done with Prometheus, and make them manageable across lots of different Kubernetes clusters, of course, including OpenShift. Um, you can check it out at github.com slash operator dash framework. Um, and it has two components. It has an SDK, which is a bunch of tools for doing the hard parts of building one of these operators, tracking related kube resources, test scaffolding, vendoring of uh, the correct libraries. And it looks like this. Uh, jokingly, uh, one of the Google engineers has called this um, a, a similar project that he was working on, um, Kubi on Rails. But you create, a, uh, you create a new version of an operator using the operator SDK command line tool and describe it, and then a scaffolding gets created for you. Um, and Philip Whitrock uh, has been working on a similar project, and we're looking to bring them together in a SIG inside of Kubernetes, which is up for proposal. The other piece is uh, oper operator lifecycle management. So you have these operators, but it's a little cumbersome. You have like this YAML file, and you got to deploy it, and then how do you upgrade it, and what version got deployed. Um, there's just a bunch of questions. And so what we're trying to do with ops operator lifecycle management is maintain a catalog so you can go in and say, these are the versions that are available to me, um, make it available to specific namespaces so that uh, cluster admin has control over what people are deploying as their monitoring tool or their database. Um, track those instances across namespaces so that people, um, like the folks at Ticketmaster, are able to figure out how many instances exist. And then, of course, apply updates in case there's some problem in uh, the piece of software, like the monitoring stack has a security issue. So it looks like this. We have these manifests. We put them in a catalog. And then you're able to deploy them across namespaces. And the OLM, the Operator Lifecycle Management, is really solving this, well, how do I deliver my app onto the Kubernetes uh, hybrid cloud? And you can do this with things built with the Operator SDK, but you can also do this with Helm charts or the Kubernetes built-in types. There's docs on the repo if you're interested. So a quick recap. Um, it's open source. It's up here. Uh, star stuff, because that's how open source software wins, is lots of GitHub stars. Um, and uh, the next steps here. We want to make more operators more easily and bring more users to those. And the why is we want to make Kubernetes the dominant API for cloud-native applications moving forward. Um, we believe at Red Hat, I believe, as somebody who's been in this ecosystem for the last five years, that this is our opportunity to make an actual compute network storage infrastructure that can run anywhere from somebody's laptop to somebody's data center to somebody's public cloud. If you want to find any of us who've been working on this, these are the faces. Uh, Kelly is right there. Uh, in particular, I don't know where Rob and Jimmy are. I think they're on plane somewhere, lost in Amsterdam. And that's all I got. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you very much for that. And that was a real sneak preview. I only saw one little graphic error. There was a draft thing up there. So I think. You'll get that right for the keynote tomorrow. So um, now I'm just going to bring up the folks who are all giving lightning talks. Now I'm going to have them sit in the order in which they're going to be on there. So if Carol would come and sit, and Clive, and then Dan and Zach are going to co-present. I don't know how you take five minutes and do it in to two people, but they're going to try. 
um, and then William and Dan, and then David Aronchik could come up. And while they're doing that, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what's been going on in OpenShift and ML. Um, and it's been very interesting to be um, in community development and community management in this era of um, so much cross-community collaboration with all the upstream projects, with Kubernetes, with OpenShift, um, with all the great stuff that's coming over from the CoreOS world. Um, and uh, many years ago, many moons ago, I was at university and taking classes in machine learning and AI way, way, way back, and there were just no compute resources um, then. It was very theoretical. And so um, imagine my surprise, you know, many years later to come back and be working on a platform, OpenShift and Kubernetes, that is now delivering the resources to use some of the tools that I only dreamed about when I was at university and had to beg and borrow for compute resources. So what we've done in the open source communities is we've done two things. Um, and on the OpenShift common side, we've created a machine learning SIG for people deploying machine learning frameworks, using machine learning, doing big data, doing anything that touches on um, OpenShift. Because one of our goals is to make OpenShift one of the, uh, uh, the, the best places to run your machine learning workloads. Um, and really what we focus on in the machine learning SIG is the use cases. We want to hear from you what frameworks, what tools, what services, what things you're, you want to do. And then there's another community, many of you here in the room are part of that, are, is the Kubeflow um, community. And that's another whole thing. And that is our last lightning talk. Um, and David Aronchik from Google has also gracious, graciously um, been co-chairing the OpenShift on ML um, uh, special interest group. So it's been a really nice collaboration um, going back and forth between these two groups and we've done some wonderful work getting Kubeflow running on OpenShift on Google Compute Cloud and lo lots of really good cross-pollination. So that's what I'm kind of here tonight to try and do is to give everybody five minutes of fame and give you the opportunity to ask questions of all of them. I, you know, I can give them a couple of softballs. I really don't want to do that in the AMA thing. I really would like you guys to try and um, think about what the questions are. And um, I'm going to get started. I'm going to get Carol up here. And we're going to do this, and we're going to try and keep it to five minutes each. I know that's hard for all of us. And here's your slide deck. And I'm going to go to the first one, view, present mode. And um, Carol Willing has been um, an amazing participant in these conversations. And she's also the person behind um, Jupyter Hub and Binder Hub and all kinds of other things that um, coming from the Python community. I am incredibly grateful for all the work they've put into it. And um, uh, really, please give your attention to her and the work that she's doing. I'm just and sticking in my back pocket. We'll get that going. All right. Okay. So Hello, here. everybody. We're going to try and keep us under five minutes. So um, once I hit the four-minute mark, just start making faces or something. So um, I've had the pleasure for about the last five years working on um, Project Jupiter, which at the time when I started was actually IPython and IPython notebooks. And um, behind me is um, the core team of Project Jupiter. We are a nonprofit um, research organization primarily and are funded by grant providers like the Moore Foundation Sloan and Helmsley Grant. And as such, we are interested in um, advancing science and usability and reproducibility and collaboration in both science and data science. And really, the emphasis on how do we get humans to go through this concept of you have an idea, you have some data, try and figure out, okay, can I do what I think I can do and how to iterate on it? And I think that lends itself very well to machine learning because you're doing prediction, you're doing recommendations, you're doing classifications. When you start your models, you don't always know exactly where you're gonna land up in the end. And I think by having the flexibility that Jupiter brings to that, um, it really helps um, you as a business come up with new project and product ideas based on what research your uh, machine learning folks are doing. 
Um, Jupyter Lab is the next generation um, notebook environment. Um, it is highly extensible, also web-based. Um, you can go ahead and try it on mybinder.org, and I um, highly encourage you to do it. Um, Jupyter Hub, which is what I primarily work on, is a way to give a notebook server to each person in a group or you know, a supercomputer center, university classes, research groups within um, businesses, um, and I have to give a huge thank you to anybody in here who's been working on making Kubernetes um, sustainable and uh, easy to use. It has really helped us with deploying, helping our users deploy Jupyter Hub and the Jupyter Notebooks at scale. And so thank you for your efforts there. Um, and I guess I just want to say that we see that we've just barely scratched the surface of what can be done both at scale and with machine learning tools. And I'm really excited to see the things that are going to come forward with Kubeflow, um, using Jupyter to kind of interact with humans in this loop and um, see what you guys collaborate on and share. Thank you. Was I under five minutes? Right on time, that was great. So um, next up we have Clive Cox from Selden, am I saying it right? Selden, that's right. Selden, see, I can, say, I can say it, I just didn't spell it right a couple of times. Um, and they are new OpenShift Commons members, so um, while well, you get hooked up. If you don't know what OpenShift Commons is, it is the open source community that's built up around OpenShift. And um, there's a gentleman in the room, is Mike here? Mike. He's the tallest person here. If you haven't joined um, OpenShift Commons yet and you want to be on the ML SIG mailing list, the OpenShift Commons mailing list, or just join our Slack channel, talk to him. He'll sign you up. Okay. All right. Locked and loaded. There you go. I'm, I'm uh, work at Selden. We're uh, based in Barclays. Tech Hub Wise uh, in, in London. Um, it's Accelerator with 20, 30 uh, um, companies in it. Uh, we run TensorFlow London workshop uh, every month. So if you're in London, it'd be great to have you there uh, to join in. We do, we do talks about TensorFlow. As a company, we will work on machine learning deployment and Kubernetes, and we also do consulting in the FinTech area, doing machine learning um, in various things like effect equity prediction and various other, other things. So where do we stand as a, as a company, exactly what we do in terms of our product? If you view the machine learning pipeline um, as these sort of steps, you know, from training, um, data ingestion, analysis, validation of your model, Basically, Seldon Core, which is our open source, which is I'm going to talk, what, talk about today quickly, is we just fo focus purely on machine learning deployment. So after you've done the training and you've got you, to, you want to deploy your predictor um, out, scale it, monitor it, uh, do all analysis, and do updates, do rolling updates to your machine learning uh, production. Uh, so we're so, also part of the Kubeflow um, so, so ecosystem. So you can choose Seldon Core uh, to deploy your models on Kubeflow as one of the options. You know, you can cho choose um, TensorFlow Server. You can also choose um, Seldon Core. So how do we fit? So how, do, how does it all work? So one step, once you've got your Kubernetes cluster, you can install it via Helm or KSonic. We've got our own KSonic registry as one part of Kubeflow. And then the next step is to package your machine learning runtime. Um, so for that, we use S2I, and that's what I'm going to explain today. So you, that's to take your source code of your machine learning uh, prediction point, uh, package it up as an image, and so we, we can then manage that um, uh, container, which is going to give predictions in your graph. So the, the, the final part is to actually create your runtime graph. So that's just um, saying how your components are going to fit together. Um, so your, your models, A-B tests, and other things you might do as part of the machine learning pipeline fit together and run together, and we, um, you, you define, that, define that as a resource and deploy it. We have our own operator that will understand uh, that is and, and deploy it and, and manage that graph, basically. So what we're trying to do is allow machine learning um, um, data scientists to use any toolkit, so Spark, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, what we want is they can use any toolkits they're using now, and we just manage the one-time prediction um, for their uh, models. And for that, they just need to do two things. They need to dockerize their, their runtime component and expose it using our REST and gRPC APIs. So they can do that themselves, but we want to make it really easy for them to do that. So for that, we're using Redshift, uh, um, Red Hat's open source, source to image, uh, um, um, open source tool. So just for those who, you, who haven't used source to image, there's two parts to this. So you have your code that you want to package up. So here, you, here we've got a prediction component in Python. And then we have a set of builder image that we, that we provide. 
We provide Python, R, and Java builder images that allow you to package up your source code into an image. And so we provide all the dependencies, and then we provide the scripts, in this case, assemble script to say how your source code is going to be packaged up with our dependencies, uh, runtime script of how it's going to be run, and then um, use these scripts. So these are scripts that are required by S2I, and once you've got those there, you can then use the S2I tool, and that will package it up, and it does all the work. So this is just a quick example. So here's, a, here's an example using S2I. So it's going to do a builder on the current directory. It could be from GitHub. It's going to use our Python 2 uh, builder image, and it's going to output this um, Python classifier. Um, so the first thing they need to do is have their runtime uh, component. So here's one for the standard RS classifier in Python. Um, so they do that. They can then supply a set of requirements so of what uh, packages they need, SkyKit learns, SciPy, and et cetera, and that will be included in the image. And then they just need to provide a set of, of uh, requirements of how we're going to package that image. So one is what, what the um, class is going to be called. In this case, it's always classified, so we can find it when we package it. Um, how you want to expose the API, REST or gRPC is the two APIs we handle right now. And what, it, what this is, is it a model? We also handle other types of things that allow you to do A-B tests or ensemblers and different, different forms of things like that. So once you've done that, and you can actually provide the um, environment um, as part of the command line, or you can provide it as part of the source code. So once you've got that, you just run the uh, single line of S2I, and that will build your runtime image and package it, and then we can deploy it onto your cluster. So really what we're trying to do is make it really easy for people to take their runtime components, package it up, describe the graph of what they want to deploy out there on Kubernetes, then we deploy it, it's managed by our operator, and then you can go into the virtuous loop of updating your components, changing, doing, doing A-B tests, canary rollouts, all, all sorts of things you need to do in machine learning and production to actually keep that uh, machine learning uh, component updated um, and running. So just the final slide, a few call-outs. So there's two source to image uh, uh, deep dives and intros on Thursday and Friday. And I'm, I'm going to, to more depth on Selden Core, which is the stuff that I work on on Friday, if you want to know more. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I love this because that was the shout-out that I was going to make um, in between talks was to those two source to image talks. Um, and those are really, we, we talk at OpenShift about source to image. It's, it's a tool that we use um, uh, to help build images and, and create them, and they're one, it's wonderful. But there's hundreds, not hundreds, maybe 20 um, other types of tools and approaches to creating um, your images and your containers. So at these two sessions, we're really going to talk about the use case around them, and hopefully you'll come and, and share your talks. Now, let's see. Let's get you. I know, I know. You were the only ones that sent a PDF, so. Yeah. Yeah. Following instructions. I know. I did tell you that, didn't I? All right. So, um, so please join us for those source to image sessions. Um, if you were wondering what Red Hat was doing um, in the machine learning business, um, these two folks um, yeah. come from the Rad Analytics Group and have been doing some great work. And they're going to tell you all about it now, somehow in five minutes. But go for it. I don't know if this is on. Looks like it is. OK. So. Um, you want? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about Zach and I are going to talk briefly about um, machine learning. We're both practitioners. Uh, we're using machine learning in on Kubernetes right now, um, and we're using the S2I tools that were talked about earlier. Um, and we are part of this Rad Analytics I/O team, which is uh, creating the tooling to make it really easy to run these machine learning algorithms and include them in your pipeline on OpenShift. So um, this is a really simple overview here of this uh, software stack with OpenShift, then our RAD Analytics tooling on top of that, and then uh, Apache Spark, which Zach will talk about next, and then your application, which could be, it could be something like um, a retail site online. It could be, um, I have an application for running um, performance, all of our performance tests, and I've added an, um, an intelligent portion of that because I've added a machine learning component which improves the user experience and um, it does some prediction for me. So Zach will tell us a little bit about Spark now and what it does. So, uh, so Apache Spark is, a, is the, the, so we built an analytics platform on top of OpenShift. And Apache Spark is the core 
engine for our analytics. Um, so it comes with different APIs. You can use machine learning, or you can use streaming, or you can use graph processing, um, as well as Spark SQL. Um, it comes with lots of language bindings, so if you want to do your stuff in Python, Scala, Java, um, there's S2I uh, builder images that you can, you can utilize. Um, so the, the kind of the benefit of using Spark is actually because it's, it performs optimizations. Um, it's lazy by default um, and has lots of uh, things. So think of your data being partitioned across many machines and then um, being able to query your data and do other things as well. Okay, and as you can see here with all these different APIs, like if you are used to using R, you can use Spark with R, and if you're more of a database user, you can access Spark uh, through the Spark SQL inter APIs and you know view things uh, similarly as you, as you would in a relational database. So um, machine learning uh, was a field in computer science, and uh, it is still highly interdisciplinary. Um, uh, primarily, I've used it myself for these algorithms listed at the bottom for clustering um, using things like random forest and um, regression. So some examples of how you might take a regular application that's doing just your um, transactions um, on the web and turn it into something that's using one of these uh, machine learning algorithms is, for instance, like on the Airbnb site, they use al uh, alternating least squares to, you, to give you recommendations about places you might like to stay. Say you go to a site where you, or a, uh, a place you normally would like to stay, it's already booked. Um, they will use alternating least squares to give you a bunch of other recommendations about where you might want to stay instead. Um, you can do clustering where you might want to cluster all your customers and tailor their um, experience on your website based on which of these clusters they fall into. Um, I personally used Random Forest to help me with my performance monitoring and I'm able to like pick the top 10 configuration parameters that I've set in my experiment and see which ones are um, most influential on the, on the overall performance of the codes that I'm running. Um, so this just gives you some examples, this small uh, subset of all the ML algorithms we have available in Spark. And this is the good news. Uh, we'll, um, I've done all this performance testing, and so far the overhead has been less than 10% running on Kubernetes and in clusters. I mean, in, uh, Kubernetes instead of just uh, uh, bare metal. And so Zach will talk to you a little bit about how easy it is to use this. You don't really have to be a data scientist to do this work. Um, you can, the, the API is so easy, um, pretty much anyone can just try this out. And we have a website where you can see all of our examples and try yourself. So, uh, so there's lots of tooling around that. Um, so when you're designing models and, and whatnot, then you know, there's you know, some data scientists we do have data scientists on staff that work on algorithms, and we do have, um, but then when you train the model, then you deploy the model, and then you, do, you can do things like predictions and solve uh, different problems with, with your data. So I think it's very interesting. Okay, so you can just check the, our GitHub site, Rad Analytics IO, if you want to check out our code. Thank you. Right. I, I'm gonna make you state one more thing. You also are doing another presentation here at KubeCon? All right. Um, tomorrow we're doing a presentation, Scalable Monitoring with Prometheus, because we've been using Prometheus to monitor our machine learning algorithms and our code that we've been writing. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. There you go. All right. I'm going to let you rip and roll. Let's see if I can find where I'm at. I'll let I you. totally forgot <laughs> that I put them into PDF land. Oh, somebody shut down my... And you are... That's Dan me. Daniel. All right. See? And 
view, presentation mode. And so we're giving you five minutes, but you did a, an extended version of this um, as an OpenShift Commons briefing recently. Yeah. So yes, and I think that's posted online, right? Absolutely, yep. yes. Um, so I'm Daniel Whitenack, um, and I work uh, at a company called Pachyderm. Um, so you'll hear a little bit more about Pachyderm here in a second. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that off for now. Also, I just wanted to let you know, since um, all of you being machine learning people um, and also at KubeCon, I imagine that practicality is something that you value. Um, and I'm just launching uh, this uh, practical AI podcast with uh, Chris Benson, um, at, uh, who's a chief uh, scientist at Honeywell. Um, it's being produced by the Changelog. So keep an eye on that. We're going to have a, a episode all about Kubeflow um, soon, uh, so, so keep an eye on that. Um, so the, the ML use case that I really work on with Pachyderm is creating platforms for large companies or small companies um, that, that allow them to do scalable language agnostic version data pipelining and data management. So let's kind of unpack each of those things. So scalable, I think, makes sense to you. Language agnostic makes sense to you. We're at KubeCon, everything's containers, that's good. Um, version, um, I'm gonna talk a lot about that uh, in, my, in my talk on Thursday. Um, but basically what, what I'm talking about there is creating data pipelines that are sustainable over time, such that the data and the code and the processing that you do is all versioned and tracked so that you can tie any particular result back to all the processing and data that actually led to that particular result. Um, and by data pipelining, I'm meaning that we're, we're working on these workflows that are inherently multi-stage, as, as Clive was talking about. Um, and we, we also treat this data management piece. Um, so a, a lot of, there's a lot of frameworks out there for processing and running machine learning algorithms. Um, but, but the one that we work on at Pachyderm, um, which is called Pachyderm, is, is kind of a unified view of both data processing and data management management. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we're, um, we have a bunch of production deploys of, of Pachyderm. So Pachyderm itself is an open source project. Um, there's a company around it. Um, but the, the core is open source, um, and, uh, and we're working with a bunch of different companies, but we have uh, pipelines in, in production running TensorFlow and, and PyTorch and a bunch of other weird stuff, including like bioinformatics things and all of stuff I don't know about. Um, but uh, we have, you know, clusters. We work with people up to kind of like 1,500 node clusters uh, doing a bunch of image processing and other stuff like that. Um, Okay, so just a, a quick talk advertisement. So I'm gonna be talking about compliant data management and machine learning on Kubernetes on Thursday. Um, so make a note about that. Uh, I know most of that title is really exciting for everybody. Um, and then when I add the word compliant in, then everybody no longer attends my talk. Um, so, uh, or gets sad or, or gets scared or something. But I think we're gonna have a lot of fun with it. There's gonna be a live demo. And again, we're gonna be talking about, you know, uh, actually putting pipelines into production that can be sustained over time in the face of, you know, increasing regulation, especially in the, in the EU. Um, so just to give you kind of a little taste of that, um, which uh, Clive set up great for me, um, you know, we're, we're gonna have this full data pipeline that's being driven by, by Pachyderm, um, pre-processing of data, training, and model export. Um, I'm gonna show kind of and, and motivate how um, both Kubeflow and Pachyderm can work together where Kubeflow provides a lot of the distributed, uh, distributed elements that um, are needed in machine learning. Pachyderm can do that orchestration and data management piece and then we can and hand off kind of that, that train model at the end and that artifact to something like Selden uh, for serving, all, all while keeping all of that, you know, extremely rigorously tracked and versioned all along the way from code to data to Docker images um, to actually artifacts that are deployed for serving. Um, so that's me. All right. So um, there's a lot of you in the back, so you don't be afraid to come up and fill in any empty seats if you can find one, and make sure you have a beer in your hand while you're doing it. Um, you're, st you're the stand-in. All right. Yes, you're the stand-in. Um, Lachlan um, gave a wonderful talk a yep. little while ago, and I'm gonna, um, from Microsoft, Lachlan Nevis, and he couldn't come, so we are, I'm, this, this, 
No, this is no, no, it's not you. This is not you. That's there. That's you go, William. Uh, <laughs> perfect. All right. All right. Thank you, there you go. Take so, it. hello everyone. So, my name is uh, William Butchwalter. I'm a senior software engineer at, uh, at Microsoft in the uh, AI and research group. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of context, I'm, I'm not going to talk about Azure mostly. Um, just Kubernetes in general. Uh, and I've been working in the Kubernetes slash ML space for the past 18 months. Uh, I've actually been contributing to Kubeflow since last July. It wasn't called Kubeflow back then, but still. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So I just want to talk a little bit about why are we interesting in Kubernetes, interested sorry, in Kubernetes for machine learning in the first place, right? Kubernetes has been developed with microservices in mind, not GPU workloads or anything like that. So why does it make sense to use Kubernetes? Obviously, the, the biggest, the, the strongest point for Kubernetes is the community, right? This community is just amazing and, and so large that if you're a company wanting to do machine learning training, for example, and you want to deploy a new training strategy, something, let's say, like population-based training, it's actually kind of complicated to do, but you have a, a, a good chance of finding an open source implementation already working for you on Kubernetes. So obviously, this is a strong uh, argument. Um, but then, it's also because Kubernetes, I think, has really well-designed and clean APIs. So that means even if you don't find what you want and you need to start from scratch, it's actually much easier to do that on Kubernetes than it was just a few years ago. Uh, for example, I worked actually on population-based training, so which comes from DeepMind originally, uh, with a, a large customer. And, and to implement that on Kubernetes, it just took a few days and, and an M chart. It's actually really easy because the APIs are really nice. Um, and obviously, scaling is important. Kubernetes can scale pretty largely. Um, so, for example, we have a nice case study with OpenAI. So, a few months ago, I think in, in January, OpenAI released this blog post called Scaling Kubernetes to 2500 Nodes. Um, so, they did that on Azure, and you know, it, it wasn't easy. They had, they had a lot of issues with etcd, uh, network, disk IO, etc. But ultimately, they managed to reach that scale with a, with a very small team of, of engineers. I think they were two, maybe three people. Um, and, and a single job, in their case, can go up to 10k cores. So that's, that's pretty big. And this was, they finished this clutter like last year or two years ago. And with every single release of Kubernetes and etcd, it's becoming easier and easier to go even further than that. So I'm really excited to see where, where this is going. Uh, yeah, that's my Azure slide, I guess. Uh, so we, ha we have kind of two um, offerings for Kubernetes on Azure. We have AKS, which is the full managed uh, Kubernetes, where you don't have to do, to do anything yourself. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have ACS Engine, which is open source, where you can really do whatever you want with it. So ACS Engine had support with, for GPUs for quite a while, but AKS now has, uh, has GPU support officially. Uh, and we are releasing this week uh, a workshop, so kind of 10 module labs, to walk you through doing Kubeflow on Azure. Uh, so we're assuming no knowledge, starting from zero, starting from what is Docker, because Kubeflow is nice, but we have to realize that a lot of people that want to use it don't know anything about containers and Kubernetes. And so we have to make an effort to onboard them, right? And I'm going to finish by, um, by just a, a few thoughts. So I'm not going to talk about everything here, uh, but I want to talk about two things that I think are going to be interesting. So it's a bit far-fetched, uh, but the, the first one is virtual kubelet. So if you didn't hear about that, that's um, a project basically to do an open source implementation of the kubelet that you can then back up with usually something like Azure Container Instance or AWS Fargate. Uh, but for example, someone just made a request to add a provider for Azure Batch. So Azure Batch lets you run basically GPU jobs. And you might wonder why you want to do that instead of just using GPU in Kubernetes. The reason is because you can scale pre very fast in, in a matter of seconds with Azure Batch. And so for example, it would be really nice uh, for use cases when you want to do transfer learning on very short uh, training times and when you want to keep control of the cost. Um, and another one which I'm excited about but is very early is MetaParticle. So if you were at KubeCon last year in Austin, you might have seen the keynote by Brendan Burns where basically he made this point that Kubernetes is becoming the standard runtime of the cloud, right? Uh, and since it's a runtime, we also need a standard library to go with it. So you can directly from your code deploy to Kubernetes without having to go through Docker files and Kubernetes templates. And so, I'm, I mean, I'm playing with this idea of tailoring MetaParticle to work specifically for machine learning. So for example, you could define a decorators in Python on top of your function to say, okay, I want to train this function uh, using that many agents in parallel, et cetera. 
And when you do Python MyScript, it's actually going to deploy everything, build everything, and deploy on the cloud for you. For example, using Kubeflow CRD, something like that. Uh, so obviously, it's extremely experimental. Uh, but you're just uh, sharing a few thoughts that I think are interesting. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you. All right. There you go. Let me just Thanks. throw up your slides. All right. I hope you've all been thinking of questions. All right. So we have one more talk. Um, and let's see if we can get this. And uh, I know it looks really long. Look at all those slides. Um, but he promised he was going to talk really fast. But since he's the co-chair of the, the SIG, <laughs> I'm just going to let him rattle on until we kick so, him off. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Brandon has the uh, easiest job. I have the hardest one because after this, it's you know evening activities. So um, you know this is gonna be hard. Um, uh, but I, in fact, the funny part is, is I actually have the easiest talk in the world because um, I'm David Ronchek. I helped found the Kubeflow project, but I basically do nothing. All these people are doing the stuff that makes Kubeflow great. We're just kind of wiring it together. Um, you know. Everyone hears about ML, it's changing the world, it's changing the dynamics, uh, eating everything. Uh, but the problem is, is that most of the world is like this. There's magical AI goodness on one side and everyone else is on the other side and in between there's just uh, lots of pain. Uh, and the biggest reason that there is this split between these two um, you know, opportunities to go out and get all this great uh, stuff um, and, uh, and where people are today is because uh, people have been writing these incredibly bespoke solutions for ML um, that you know, are not composable, they're hard to swap out the pieces that make sense to you, uh, or maybe your organization has a change. They're hard to be portable, meaning uh, move from your laptop to your training rig, to your on-prem, to cloud number one, to cloud number two, wherever the data is. Uh, and then finally, it's hard to scale. So you might be able to get it running on a single machine, but then to go and do that uh, just like OpenAI did on 2,500 machines uh, is very, very challenging. Um, to, to dive into each of those very briefly, um, you know, around the composability, uh, you know, people think about ML as just being this model. Um, but in fact, that's not what it is at all. It's, it's all these other things that end up being around it. And those other things are the things that, that people, great companies and projects have solved. Again, like the folks up here. Um, Pachyderm is doing the data analysis portion. Uh, Jupyter is doing the interactive uh, research. Uh, Selden doing uh, great serving and other tooling. Um, and, and today, it's very hard to tie all those components together. Um, Similarly, portability, once you get your uh, stack up and running on top of Kubernetes, uh, it may be made up of this many layers or more. And when I talk about that pipeline earlier, that may just be that top portion, let alone everything that's below it. And then you go to your training rig and it's something completely different. And then you go to your cloud and it's something completely different again. And you're uh, hit uh, over and over and over again with the various, um, uh, you know, reset up and, and differences between those environments. Uh, and then finally, scalability. Um, you know, I mentioned already scaling via nodes. Uh, that is one type of scalability. There are other scales. There's um, how do you scale the number of experiments that you run? How do you scale your teams? How do you scale your data? All these various things. Um, those components are, are, are involved in scalability as well. So, um, you know, uh, containers and Kubernetes are pretty good at solving this, but um, the problem is, is that you end up having to become an expert in a whole bunch of things as it stands today, uh, which is not great. So uh, that's why we introduced Kubeflow. How can we make this overall system much easier for you? Um, and our mission here, and I say it over and over again, make it easy for everyone to learn, deploy, and manage portable distributed ML on Kubernetes. That is not us as part of the Kubeflow project writing all this stuff. This is packaging and helping other projects make their services available in a standard-based way so that you can swap in and out, so that you can scale them, so that you can move them from place to place. Um, you know, around that portability component, the way to think about it is that bottom section becomes all Kubernetes. That's the abstraction layer there. And then the section over on the other side becomes Kubeflow, and you're able to stamp out that Kubeflow in every location that you have. Uh, today, in the box, 
Um, and, uh, you know, on Friday, don't tell anyone, but we'll be announcing that we've cut our 0.1 release, um, which we're very proud of. Uh, <laughs> thank you. But um, specifically in the box today, we have Jupyter, we have TensorFlow, we have Argo for workloads, we have Selden Core in the box. Um, uh, Daniel uh, uh, is very, working very hard on a Pachyderm proposal that we're very excited about. Uh, we have reverse proxy via Ambassador, uh, and we'll be talking about all the sorts of things we have. Uh, for out of that overall s uh, section up there, uh, it's basically these components uh, already have an option in the box, uh, but you can use many more. Um, and we are really are just getting started. This is a very small subset of the people who are helping out today. Um, and we're really excited. You know, the, this is, uh, I, I happen to be from Kubernetes from, I don't know, day negative 10. Uh, and uh, it really feels like that again. I, you know, there were so many, when we first got Kubernetes up and running, there were so many container solutions, so many orchestration solutions. Uh, everyone was just looking for something to rally around. Um, and that's what Kubernetes provided. Kubeflow feels very, very similar. It, it feels like there's so much activity and everyone just wants a place, a community, uh, to come together and rally together and, and form this vision of what we all think is right in the world. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. So uh, thank you very much. So thank you. All right. So this is the Q&A part of the room. I mean, I have a lot of questions that I could ask these guys, but I'm hoping a few of you have questions as well. Is there any questions yet in there? I mean, you have beers in your hands, so I know you're happy. But, well, I'm, I've got one that after, here's one over here. Let me struggle down. Yeah, that'd be great. Kubernetes, the runtime of the cloud, what's this all about? I mean, come on, what are you guys talking about? Oops, here we go. I'm just curious on that statement. I'm, I'm, I can't, so who was just saying it? Was it, uh, yeah. Can you, I, yep. We just hear this a lot now. I'm just really curious. What do you mean by it? Here's another one. There's one. There we go. Thanks. Yeah. They, they all should work, and there's three of them, Those I think. Two. All right. Here's, here's, um, here's, so, so what I was saying was basically um, that today, if, if, if you want to run your application in any cloud, what's the easiest way that you can find to do that? Uh, and with AWS that now has EKS, that's going to be public pretty soon, I think Kubernetes is pretty much the only solution you have that you can deploy in one click on all major cloud providers. And if you write your applications to work with the Kubernetes API, then basically you don't have to care anymore about which provider is, is beneath that, right? It's, it's, it's kind of a runtime, as you can think of, for example, Java, where you just talk to GVM and you don't care anymore about the DOS, which is underneath, right? So that was my, what I'm trying to say. Is there, any, is there another question? I, I have a question for probably, each of you have, has a different flavor um, of a platform and an, of a way of packaging. You've described how you packaged up your containers and stuff. And one of the things that Kubeflow is, it, we're trying to solve with Kubeflow is um, being able to share those packaged up, containerized things. But the other thing is we want to be able to tweak them as well. And I'm curious how far we've thought that through is like, so if I create a stack that has Jupyter Hub in it, when I get to use Jupyter Hub with uh, you know, Apache Spark or whatever the other tool frameworks are, and I want to pass that on, one of the things that Jupyter Hub is wonderful for is doing, uh, allowing us to share those um, notebooks and other things. But as we get more complicated in our things, how, um, how are we thinking about that, be, not just being able to share things that we've trained, but be able to tweak them and then share them again? Is there an approach that we've, you, we're working on with Kubeflow for that, maybe, David? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I say this all the time, um, and, and you heard it from all the folks up here, uh, particularly uh, Carol, um, uh, you know, the reproducibility problem, Who, who's heard that there's a reproducibility problem in uh, ML? Uh, all right, so those that haven't raised your hands, if you're getting to ML, you will. It's that, you know, there's this fundamental issue right now where it's not just, um, uh, you know, something complicated like, well, I, I need to understand exactly what this model did. Literally, the best engineers in the world are having trouble reproducing their own experiments that they ran previously because 
you know, the Python library changed or things like that. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the things that Kubeflow is really trying to um, uh, do. There's already great ways to share mo the text of models. Uh, with folks like uh, Daniel and Pachyderm on the case, I think there's a great way to share versioned d data. I think today, right now, and, and this is really what Kubeflow is trying to solve, how do you describe in code the exact uh, deployment that you used to run this? What libraries were involved? What versions were involved? How do you containerize it? And so, again, in Kubeflow, we're not trying to reinvent this. There's already Docker, there's already the OCI, uh, there's already Kubernetes. Um, these ways can describe the underlying infrastructure. What we need to do is describe what happens above that in order to enable you to run the kernel that uses the data. And so I, you know, my, my hope, and I, you will hear me say this over and over and over again, is at some point in the future, uh, cross my fingers, that Kubeflow succeeds, um, that we, every research paper in the world ends with three you know, URLs. Your, a URL for your Kubeflow deployment, a URL for your model, and a URL for your data. And anyone can then, with those three things, reproduce the underlying um, uh, experiment that was run in the paper. So that's my hope. Yeah. So, so Daniel, you, you use the compliance word, yeah, which is part of the reproducibility as well. Um, and you know, that puts in some of our hearts fear and loathing, but and from someone who came out of audit and IT a long time ago, it's, it's one of the thing, key pieces. And so how are you in, uh, enabling compliance in, in your efforts there? Because that's part of the reproducibility piece. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, I mean, how we're really thinking about it, um, which doesn't, doesn't cover all aspects of it. Um, there's certainly like anonymization and privacy things that we don't tackle. There's great companies like Amuda tackling those things. Um, but what we're really trying to tackle is the question of um, for a particular result, how do you go about explaining or making transparent all the different data and processing that led to that particular result, and not just in terms of metadata, so not just describing it, but actually being able to go back and grab those versions of data and grab those versions of your Docker image of your, of your code and actually be able to rerun every single thing that you did to produce the, the same result um, again. Uh, and, and so like the, the way that we're enabling that is within the Pachyderm project, um, the, the open source project, there's a, a data management and a data pipelining piece. Every stage of your data pipeline is, um, is defined by a container um, or multiple containers or we're now running TF jobs in, in Kubeflow. Um, and uh, each input and output data from each of those stages is completely version controlled in Pachyderm's version control, which is backed by an object store of your choice. So that's how we stitch all of those things together. And just to kind of follow up on the, on the previous question too, I think the, the way that we're setting up some of these things, and I think this goes for, for everybody, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think we are building, a, and we were just talking about this in the happy hour previous to this happy hour. Um, there have been a uh, lot of happy hours. That, that, uh, there will that, be more too. Yeah, <laughs> that, um, that w one of the goals is we know people will want to do a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. So um, part of the goal that we're trying to do is show people one way to do that the thing but give them flexibility so if you're you know if you're running your pachyderm pipeline and you want to switch out you know tensorflow for pytorch that's totally cool with us it's just another container we treat it in the same unified way we tra treat the version data and the processing in the same way and so i think that goes across the board for for selden and jupiter and kubeflow and all of these projects are kind of building that that hope of flexibility in so yeah, I was just going to say, I, I tend to, you know, I have a background in econometrics and data can tell you many things. Um, how the data is used is actually really important because that's what really impacts humans. And think about it, like you wind up with some disease that is being diagnosed and you know, the healthcare algorithm runs through its machine learning thing. Yay, you get funding for care. No, you don't. Um, you know, to be able to go back and audit 
how the decision was made, whether that was the humane decision to have been made is really important. And, you know, that's just one example. There's many examples. So I think, you know, reproducibility is not just a technical need. It is a societal need as well when it comes to machine learning. Here we go. Keep going. This, this yeah, is yeah, a sure. I was going to say that one of the challenges that we have with working with um, banks and putting machine learning into production is, is really to get an understanding of the complex models. They're very wary of putting uh, deep learning into production when they don't understand, you know, what are the range of the outputs for the different inputs and how can, if it's especially it's going to be uh, responses that are going to go back to a human being, how can they explain the responses back to human beings that are going to be affected by those, those um, actual predictions? So understanding how to explain the uh, machine learning uh, predictions in, in a higher level way, which obviously there's a lot of work and research being done like Lime a few years ago and other, other techniques is, is very key to give the confidence to uh, in the actual fintech world to actually get these machine learning, these com more complex models into production. And uh, it's just certainly a challenge. Okay, I was just gonna say that in my last job, I worked uh, in climate modeling where bit for bit reproducibility is key so you have to, someone writes a scientific paper, they have to go back and rerun it and get bit for bit results. And I've been frustrated by this idea of having like the latest version of some image or something. So I'm really looking forward to being able to have complete reducibility, reproducibility and I'd be a lot more comfortable with that. So it's wonderful. Although right now what I do is very manual to yeah. get yeah, the, things, everything reproducible. Yeah, there are a lot and of manuals. The exact same versions for everything. Yeah. I agree with that point that uh, Diane raised, and uh, one one other thing that uh, that I think is very important is, you know, um, we should also look at analyzing the performance of training our machine learning jobs, and then looking at, you know, are we optimizing to the fullest? Are we tuning these these jobs, um, and then looking for ways to improve upon that, and then, you know, as we iterate, we we roll out, you know, and and when data scientists have more time to you know, roll out more experiments. Uh, the, the faster you give them feedback, the faster they can roll out newer and, and more experiments. So, so this is, you, know, you touch on the performance piece. We've touched on the, the reliability pieces of this thing. Um, one, of, one of the things, um, like a lot of us have used, how many of you have used Jupyter Notebooks? All right. And, and a lot of us have gotten to use some of the different frameworks um, at least on our laptops or whatever size cluster we're given access to. But one of the, the biggest issues is um, getting the CPU resources and the, to scale these things and to, to work this stuff at scale. And um, I know that you've done a lot of work over at Microsoft and, and the OpenAI project um, did a wonderful thing. But how, um, how, how realistic is it that we're going to be able to take um, and get those resources um, t and make that make make these m these notebook things that we're doing actually truly scale is there yeah so that, that that's a good question um, honestly I, I don't have a, a very good answer for that um, so one of the things that actually makes deploying Kubeflow at scale much easier is obviously Kubeflow. Um, they we did a lot of, lot of work on that. Um, and, and recently I was at an event where uh, we actually needed to deploy, I don't remember exactly, but around 100 Jupyter notebooks for, every, for everyone in, in the room, right? And I, I, had not, I, I couldn't use Kubernetes. And I was actually very sad because what is in Kubeflow for this is actually, is actually perfect, right? Um, and so I'm not sure if your question was how to scale the number of, of different Jupyter hubs that you could have, or if it's assigning everything to a single instance. The, the, the latter. The last one, yeah. So now for that, for that I, I don't really have a, a, good, uh, a good sense to give you, but for sure, um, w with Kubernetes and, and with, with the thread version and some, with stuff like PVCs and uh, parent, parent storage, we could see solutions where you could gradually increase the number of GPUs or CPUs you, as, you assign to, um, to a single pod. Obviously, it's going to be limited by your VM size at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, so if your VM is a GPU max, that's, you're not going to further than that. Uh, but we could see solutions where, uh, where you, you will actually could increase gradually from, from one to eight. Okay. I don't know if this one works. They all work. So the way we do it is um, we, we have a, so I instrumented a Java agent that runs alongside Spark. Um, the cluster, and also when you have a job running, 
then I inject the Java agent. This is using JMX exporter if you're familiar with it. Um, so the driver gives you particular metrics about your job. Um, tomorrow, actually, we, we actually have a presentation tomorrow where we talk about doing some you know, slight modifications to code and then finding um, a more than 10% 10, 10 improvement, right, Diane? Seventy-six percent improvement, and uh, and yeah, like I mean, definitely the observability is very important. Like, because once we have these Prometheus endpoints, we can point Prometheus to it, and Prometheus can do service discovery on Kubernetes and pull network, I/O, memory, CPU, and a lot of other metrics that you want to kind of look at as well. All right. So we get. I was just going to yeah. So probably what you're going to say, but I was just going to, to do one of those points, which is. We don't need to assign everything to to um, to the Jupyter instance, but instead, what would be a nice solution would be to have clean APIs for Kubeflow that we could call in from Jupyter. I don't know if that's what you were going to say. Or... Um, well, that, that's a great example. I I would I, I will say one higher level thing, just generally, is um, I think there are two two really fundamental things right now. Um, one is uh, everyone's having to redo everything from scratch right now. Even the most basic image detection, object detection, so on and so forth models um, are incredibly manually done uh, that, you know, I, I can go and download a model that I saw in some paper or uh, in a blog post or something like that and run it and get literally one-tenth the performance of the thing that was there and it's not obvious to me. Um, again, my, my hope is that we're able to pass around uh, standards on this, maybe using Kubeflow or whatever it might be, but develop a set of standards and say, hey, if you run this model in this way, um, you know, you're, you're going to do much better. Um, the, the second thing, and, and it, you know, unfortunately it's, it's no one up here, um, uh, but I think that there is a transformation that's occur occurring right now, uh, which is um, ML frameworks are, are notoriously finicky to very subtle changes in your underlying hardware, drivers, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, really? it's terrible. And, um, uh, you know, it, in a lot of ways it feels like 1965 in computing. Like no one's even come along and invented C yet. Uh, TensorFlow is great, PyTorch is great, CAFE is great. You know, they're, they're really good, but they're still asking people to understand exactly how much, you know, RAM is on this particular GPU. And it's just crazy town. Like you can't have people doing that, especially if you're an data scientist or you're just a scientist and you're looking to, you know, understand climate modeling, there's the, the thought that you have to also understand, you know, what the, you know, frame buffer looks like on this particular version of this particular GPU is, is crazy. Um, and so I think that, that the ML frameworks are, are doing a lot of work to get better around this. Um, I do highly recommend um, uh, going and watching the TensorFlow Dev Summit. Uh, there was some really cool stuff. In particular, um, Swift for TensorFlow is a compilation language um, that takes uh, TensorFlow and, and actually uses uh, first-class compilation. Um, and uh, it's really interesting stuff. And, and I, I think that all the major frameworks will ultimately go in, in that direction. Okay. I think we finally have an audience. You guys put down your beer and ask a question. Hello. Oh. Hey, how you doing? Uh, so um, it's obvious for me, and I have yeah. Sorry, yeah, I've had two glasses of wine here. So uh, <laughs> it seems that uh, it, it, like the open source movement is really driving the innovation behind this. But but and. I have a very limited knowledge around this, but what about the models themselves? And you, you mentioned you, you download a model. Are we seeing kind of like the same innovation happening around the models themselves? So you train something and that is also shared among the community of, of, of the AI and ML movement? No. <laughs> uh, and could, why? It, it could though. Uh, yeah. There, I, there's so, potential. So I, I, I will, so that was my, my funny answer, but I will mention a couple of, of really interesting things that are going on. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so definitely each kind of, um, everybody's publishing their models. Um, they talk about them in papers. Um, if, if you're lucky, then you will kind of, there's like pre-trained versions of these models um, on, on the internet. Uh, they're in all sorts of different formats. It might be protobuf in, in TensorFlow and um, CAFE model in CAFE. So there's a lot of different models and so the, there's not even standardization around that. And, and as, as David mentioned, a lot of times you don't see the same, 
the same performance that's that's uh, that's quoted when when you run it. Um, there are a couple of really interesting things going on. There's the the Onyx project, ONNX, which is attempting to kind of provide a standardization for uh, a, a neural network exchange format um, so that, you know, you could take a, a TensorFlow model and run it in, in other frameworks and kind of have that exchange and export. There's also um, a lot of work um, by, by people like uh, from, from Intel around things like NGraph, which kind of compile the models. Um, uh, from, from one format to another and even compile them for certain hardware such that it's optimized for that hardware and runs well on that hardware like, like David was mentioning. Um, so there, there is work going on there, but as of now, it, I would say it's still kind of a little bit the, the Wild West, but hopefully that's changing. I don't know. We need more mics next time. I think you get like a combination of things. I think there are a lot of things that are very open, uh, research being done at Microsoft, being done at Google. Um, there are excellent websites that go along with actual research that's being done. And you know, certainly in the academic world, that is also happening. One of the interesting things is this in some ways parallels electronics back 20 years ago because, you know, as a business, you might not always want to disclose and be completely transparent on what your model contains. So in the old days, you'd get a circuit board and you'd reverse engineer it. The same thing is going to happen with models, um, especially when you see a successful model. Um, people are going to try and reverse engineer it. And so I, I think there is sharing going around, but it, there's not like a one place fits all at this point. So pass. There we go. So so there there are pre-trained models out there on the web, um, things to experiment with. But I mean, you want to use your own data and data that you own, and then train that your model with that data. Yeah, just uh, ec echoing a couple of the points that were made. First, uh, you know, this is, um, uh, it it's crazy how specific the data is as well. Like, you could have something that, that is a perfect model for uh, baseball game tickets, and it doesn't work because you're selling movie tickets now. Or you, you do uh, baseball game tickets in Seattle, and it doesn't work in Miami because the traffic is different. I mean, it's just crazy how, like, absolutely specific. And so for those that haven't gotten into this, it, it, you know, you, you think um, as a coder, you know, I was like, oh, okay, you know, when I first looked at this, I'm like, okay, the, all the code is there. This is fairly straightforward. In fact, that code doesn't even represent half. It doesn't even represent, you know, one-tenth of the overall information. It, what, what happens is that code basically determines the weights and the weights basically determine, you know, the combination of those two together, your graph plus your weights makes all the difference um, here. And so that's what's extremely hard to be portable. Even if you, you package that entire thing up, there are pre-trained models out there. And there's some very good ones. Uh, uh, tensor to Tensor is a great generalized one and, and there, there are lots of other things out there. Um, but it is uh, crazy. Um, how non-portable these things are. And again, I hope the compilation changes that. One thing I, I want to highlight, uh, which is um, what Carol said, that it is absolutely correct. Uh, there is a real thought that we are going to lock down our models and they're going to be, you know, because it's trained on my private data and I know more about this than anyone and my recommendation engine is going to be the best. The number you want is uh, 500. There's an academic paper out there right now that says if you give me 500 arbitrary queries against your model, I can get 90% accurate what the underlying weights are. 500. It, models are very, very quickly going to be completely undefensible, but it doesn't matter because they're so specific. Like I could go reverse engineer your model and know exactly what it is and it doesn't help me at all because I don't have the data. Yeah. I think that just, is this on? Yep. It points out the importance of understanding your data. It's true in the scientific community. I think it's going to be true in the, in the business communities. A big part of this is truly understanding the data or you're just going to be making all the wrong conclusions about what's really going on. So there's no, it's not easy. It's not yeah. an easy thing and people are going to have to understand their data. It is. I think we have one more question from the audience. Yeah, so, uh, ooh, hi everyone. Um, 
so my question is around adoption of the frameworks, technologies underneath, rather than the models and all that good stuff. How close are we? Uh, how how much growth has there been on the commercial side for the frameworks around things like RAD analytics and stuff like that, and uh, and not just with customers, but also with community. How much are they growing as well? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, so I can't answer for the other for the other frameworks necessarily, but I, c I can answer for for Pachyderm at least. Um, I, I mean, I can answer that. I also see, as as David mentioned, a lot of momentum with Kubeflow, and it's really exciting to see that. Um, just community-wise, like you were mentioning, um, with with Pachyderm, we've been uh, we've been we went to production 1.0 version in tw spring of 2016. Um, so it's been a good long while after that, and we've got um, seen a lot of adoption after that. You know, like I mentioned, you know, large clusters, small clusters. Um, uh, we've got. Uh, uh, lots of different companies, like the well, it's not a company, the D Department of Defense, um, adopting this uh, for for some of their their work. Um, so uh, we we're we're encouraged, and and I mean, we we have more work than we know what to do with. So that's that's good. But. Pass it down. I mean, as far as Jupyter goes, there's over 2 million notebooks on GitHub alone, and you know you can do like the trending uh, machine learning stuff and really get a sense of what's being used in machine learning today. Um, Jupyter has um, been adopted by things like CERN, Open Dream Kit, you know, Large Space Telescope, LIGO when we did the gravitational waves, um, you know. In some ways, it's a de facto standard for you know interactive, collaborative computing and the computational ideas that I said. So, which isn't to preclude other front ends because let's face it, you want a front end that's going to best match your use case, and that won't be Jupiter in all cases. We hope in most cases, but not necessarily in all cases. So, I think um, we're in very early days, but I can say. You know, from what I've seen in terms of Jupyter Hub, having Kubernetes and the ability to have a Helm chart that lets you do like a more declarative um, deployment and, and list of things that are in that deployment was a huge step forward. Um, it helped us help other people deploy Jupyter Hub more easily. Okay. So I don't see any other questions from the audience. Is there one more question? Okay. Actually, a follow-up question. So, I view this as, and, and again, I might be understanding things wrong. There are models that, from a perspective, is about, for instance, saving lives, cancer diagnosis, self-driving cars, avoiding collisions, lots of different things. Uh, isn't there a, a potential kind of like in a regulated market where there be, would be a great benefit of actually sharing these? So, there's kind of like an ethics side to this. You know, and and not going into the social aspects of, of uh, knowledge about us as, as people, but kind of like where there's actually humankind kind of evolutionary possibilities of this, and are we seeing that growth of also sharing about well, the, the exploring of the universe? That's a problem we share. What about these things? Is that something that we're seeing picking up? So pass the mic down. Maybe David has an answer. Um, one of the things that I spent like a good part of a week last month doing was working with some large um, organizations, government and healthcare related things. And you know what we're looking at is how do we enable services to be deployed um, securely, effectively, and reproducibly across many different. Um, you know, deployments. And I, I think what you're saying is, yeah, there's a moral imperative to, you know, share the things to, that make sense to be shared and to, you know, work together. And that's where I think the open source piece is really um, important because, you know, we can, you know, recommend what would be best for a large scale national health system or something like that. And then, you know, another country could potentially use it. But, um, you know. um. We're having Hello. Hey. Um, so yeah, the the uh, 
There's the technical side, which is, again, models uh, typically are not uh, very shareable, but kind of once you solve a problem, um, then it's solved, right? Theoretically, you have a lung cancer model and it detects it in, in um, imagery and that's wonderful. Um, and, and I will say that more than anything, uh, I, this, this community, the, the ML community broadly is crazy open. Um, the number of papers, the number of uh, reproductions that you can do, you know, right, right now I can go all open source, download the exact model, um, uh, I, I think it was developed by Google, I'm not sure, ResNet, um, that, that literally is better than human performance at generalized object detection in imagery. Uh, I actually don't remember who it is, but not only that, plus the data, it's amazing, right? And, and that's available and I can download it. But like I said, the real problem today is that that's a very specific use case. So let's say, to, to take, a, uh, take that and go uh, commercial, let's say I'm eBay and I want to um, you know, uh, automatically categorize imagery that was uploaded so that it's easy to search for, right? That's a fairly common problem. That generalized solution may not be good for my domain, right? I, you know, it can identify a coat. It doesn't know the difference between a raincoat and a trench coat and a leather coat and so on and so forth. It can only identify coat. Um, some of the research that's going on right now, which is really exciting, is around what's called transfer learning. And that's the way to think about it is um, we're going to train 80% of the way there or 90% of the way there and then you take your domain specific data and apply it to that model and do the final training. And that little bit um, requires, you know, one, one thousandth the amount of data, which is the biggest problem. Another stat for you, um, uh, you can get acceptable performance out of a model. D a rule of thumb is uh, acceptable performance out of a model with about 5,000 data points uh, to get better than human level performance uh, takes about 10 million. So the gap is that big. And so if you can drop the amount of data by one one thousandth, that's great. Um, but, but like Carol said, I think there is a deep, deep moral and ethical and uh, uh, issues here and uh, we need to really, really understand them because, uh, and I highly recommend this book, it's, it's uh, fantastic, it's called uh, Weapons of Math Destruction um, and it is uh, all about the, I think a, a great at least initial framework around what, what rules we need in this new algorithm world where how do you make things transparent, how do you constantly evolve your model, things like that because I'll, I'll tell you what, if, if I, you know, if ML was available in 1965 and I built uh, a model around, you know, real estate loans, uh, I'd still be um, uh, biasing against women and people of color today, yeah. right? So how does my model evolve? How do I understand biases? All those kind of things. Yeah. And so on, on that note, I'm, I'm going to actually stop uh, because there's still beer to be drunk and I want everybody to get a chance to mingle and let our panelists get a beer too. Um, I really, er, almost everybody up here has a talk at um, almost, I said almost, <laughs> right? Almost everybody up here has a talk or will, and, and everybody up here will be here all week long at KubeCon um, and we'll make sure when we post the videos we give you links to, to reach out and, and meet with uh, and talk to all of these folks. Um, there's been, you know, a lot of different things talked about here. All of them have, um, have done or will do uh, an OpenShift Commons briefing. There's, there'll be at the beginning of April, um, post Red Hat Summit when I can breathe again, or the beginning of not May or June or whenever, June, June 6th, I think is next OpenShift um, machine learning SIG. There'll be a couple of Kubeflow ones. Actually, you guys will be a little bit more regular than we are. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to connect with these folks. You should, I think we were talking about doing a doc sprint on Kubeflow and OpenShift um, with the Jupyter Hub folks here. So please um, spend, I'm gonna do a little quick talk, uh, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to KubeCon, um, but please Thank these folks for taking the time and being here and sharing this information and make sure you connect with them. So. All right, then I, I mentioned the machine learning um, on OpenShift SIG. David mentioned the Kubeflow community. You can get them and find them on GitHub. You can find the machine learning one on um, comments.openshift.org. Um, we're gonna let the panelists go. Many thanks. 
grab a beer. I paid for them. They're free. Um, if anybody, some of these tables are a little fill. Um, and now I'm just going to do a, a really quick talk, um, and, and I'm also going to give a shout out before I even do this to um, the, the new team from CoreOS who actually um, wrote and took my raw notes and turned them while I was on a beautiful holiday last week in Norway. Uh, I finally got to take a vacation, and the Norwegian tax group is here. Thank you very much for, you know, I paid a lot of taxes in Norway, but it was worth every penny. Um, I had a great time. We rented a caravan. We went all over Norway, and we saw some of the most amazing things. Um, and if I could, I'd be doing that all over Denmark this week, too, but I'm going to be here at KubeCon. So I'm just going to give you a quick um, few tips about, and this whole blog post is on blog.openshift.com, so do not try and write down all of these things. But um, from my perspective, um, one of the wonderful things about CoreOS joining um, Red Hat was um, all of these new colleagues, and lots of people from um, uh, Mr. Crowling to Josh Burkus, who's um, the community manager, um, Diane Fetima, who was on the panel, um, all kinds. Brandon's got a couple of talks. There's talks every single day. So I'll let you read the blog post, and while you're reading all that, I'll tell you about a really cool thing. If you sneak away from um, KubeCon for a day here, go to the site, um, Google Six Forgotten Giants of C Copenhagen. And um, if you ever were a geocacher like me, um, this artist, Thomas Dambo, has built from um, pallets, from wooden pallets, these beautiful, hidden all over um, the, the greater Copenhagen area, a whole bunch of these things. Some of them are underneath um, the, uh, the bridges. There's a little map you can go and explore. So I really tell you to, um, yeah, stay at KubeCon, go to all the sessions we're going to tell you about, but do take an opportunity to go off and um, see a little bit of us. And this is one of the wonderful, magical things about being in Scandinavia, besides the Norse mythology in Norway, um, the trolls in, here in Denmark and the Swedes. Um, Thursday, again, I do not know how I'm going to get to all of these sessions and um, to connect with everybody, but there's a whole lot of stuff. Maje is here, um, is giving a talk on writing kube controllers. There's just, um, you know, I, we mentioned a couple of times, I'm going to keep shouting out to the, the source to image conversations that we're trying to have um, to really get deep or into the use cases around creating images and containers and the, the workflows around them. So that's really going to, but then Thursday night, there's this thing of the Tivoli Gardens. There's a roller coaster here and a garden and a beautiful place. Um, and there'll be buses in the evening and beer again. So um, please make sure you do leave um, this beautiful Bella Center and, and go off and do that. So on Friday, if you're not already tired from everything that you did on Thursday and um, you have, you know, you're not seasick from the roller coaster, um, there are still even more talks. And um, again, um, we have Elsie uh, Phillips is doing a great talk. Um, has done some amazing things with the um, National Institute of Technology Standards, and um, just really, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to that talk. But my other thing is if you don't have any time to go buy souvenirs, I know there's famous Lego things and all that, and if you have kids, you're obliged to bring Legos home. But there's a store here in Copenhagen, and they're around the world too, called Flying Tiger. And I'm Canadian, we have this thing called the dollar store. It's like you go in and everything is made in China and it's like $2 or less, because a toonie or a loonie in Canada. But at um, Flying Tiger, it's kind of like that, except it's got Danish design influence. And they also have really inexpensive tins of Danish cookies. You know those things that you get in the beautiful tins? So my tip to you, when you're Friday, when you're totally fried, there's lots of flying tigers all over Copenhagen. Find one of them and take home one of their really cool tins of um, uh, Danish butter cookies. That will make everybody happy. But, um, and you should all by now have at least had one beer or two glasses of wine or three, maybe now you've had three now. Okay, so you're fine. Um, I don't have to worry about you. But um, we will have a big booth at Red Hat as we always do here because we really want to support the uh, Kubernetes community. Um, you can find all of the people that um, are talking at talks at some point or other, we'll, you can meet them in the Red Hat booth. Um, I really highly encourage you, Michael, the tall man there, if you haven't joined OpenShift Commons yet and you want to get in the Slack channel and get into some of these conversations, meet the, the tall man. 
um, and he will sign you up um, and get you enrolled in the OpenShift community. We don't spam. We just send out announcements about when briefings are coming, um, when the next ML SIG is. Go to um, commons.openshift.org. You will find the ML SIG. You can sign up for that. There are a whole lot of other SIGs if you're into operations. Um, that's not the game operation. Um, or OpenShift on OpenStack. There's a SIG for you there. So please um, take a moment, take a look, sign up, um, join us, or just come and find us at the booth um, over the rest of the week. And you know what? It's not even day one KubeCon, and you're, sti you're still standing. Your jet lag hasn't kicked in yet. It will, probably around Friday when you have to get back on the plane and go home. But we're all in the same boat. Um, some of you get to live in Norway and stay here in, in this time zone, and you're really, really lucky. But the rest of us um, will be jet lagged and dreaming about it on the flights home. So really, thank you very much for your time tonight, um, for coming to KubeCon, for coming to this event this evening. Um, I really hope you will get involved in both the KubeFlow community, the OpenShift on ML com communities, and um, stay deeply involved in the Kubernetes community because it's been a wonderful adventure the past five years. So please keep it going. Thank you. <laughs>